Next to dogmen, I think skinwalkers are the creepiest creatures on the block. Their shape-shifting ability just blows my mind. Where is the best place to find these reality-exploding evildoers? Well, for these stories, we're traveling back to the legendary skinwalker hunting ground of the Navajo Reservation. Welcome to The In-Between. I'm Carol Ann, and today we have two stories for you. One recent and one about a century old that will have you questioning whether you can truly believe what you see. Somewhere back around 2009-2010, Jalen and his girlfriend, Lakaila, take a trip with their Navajo friend, Shannon, to visit Shannon's mom and some of her family who live out on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. They get there at night, and as you may or may not know, there isn't really electricity, or running water for that matter, on most of the reservation, so it gets very dark at night. When they get to Shannon's friend, Louise's Hogan, which is a traditional Navajo dwelling made mostly of dirt and wood, they get out of the car and Jalen takes a glance up at the night sky. And holy crap, he's never seen stars like that before or since. He feels like he's standing at the center of a real life planetarium. It is just so insanely beautiful. They go inside and Jalen notices that the Hogan has a dirt floor and there's only a dim light cast from some kerosene lanterns. Jalen has never been inside a traditional Navajo Hogan before, so he's kind of tripping a little, but in a good way. Lakila announces, I need a bathroom. Louise tells her that she can use the outhouse, but be careful because they've seen some mountain lion tracks around there recently, and she hands Jalen a 45 revolver and some rounds to put in it. So he loads the shells into the 45 and he and Lakaila head out to the outhouse. Jalen is on high alert, fully expecting a mountain lion to come ripping around the corner any minute. So he's like super hyper focused on his surroundings. The first thing that he notices is that it's extremely quiet around them. And as everyone knows, this is typically indicative of the presence of a large predator. Jalen also thinks he sees something moving through the brush, but it's so dark he can't really tell if there's something coming or if his eyes are just playing tricks on him. The other thing Jalen notices is a distinct odor in the air. It smells like rotten trash mixed with poop. But he thinks maybe that's just because he's standing next to the outhouse. Lakaila finishes up inside and they start making their way back to the Hogan. Something runs out in front of them and Jalen raises the revolver but doesn't shoot. Could be a mountain lion or could just be some stray res dog. They get back to the Hogan and Jalen unloads the revolver and puts it back up on the shelf where Louise had gotten it from. Louise is there with her kids, and it's a small living space. Plus, she's not real hip on the idea of strangers staying in her house with her kids there. So, Shannon, Lakaila, and Jalen thank Louise for the restroom and the chance to stretch their legs and get back in the car because they still have to get to Shannon's mom's house. And Shannon's mom is Hopi and lives on the Hopi side of the fence. So, they still have a ways to go. Getting around the reservation can be difficult in the daytime when directions usually include such verbiage as take a right at the old red tire or when you get to the fork in the road, take it at night. Good luck. The Navajo Nation is 27,000 square miles of dirt roads and dry wash arroyos and it is nighttime. It's really easy to get lost out there as there's just enough shrubbery and topographical relief to make it impossible to see too far in any one direction. They have Shannon with them, but even she's having a tough time finding the road out to the Hopi. The road is fairly well boxed in on either side with pinyon trees and juniper bushes, but something runs out of the brush and slaps the car with a loud boom. Jalen's driving, so he hits the brakes, thinking maybe somebody needs help. Shannon is instantly freaked and yells at Jalen, keep 
driving. Jalen checks the rear view mirror and can see something in the brake lights. Looks like a person, only they look like they're crouched over in an awkward angle and it looks like they're wearing some kind of animal pelt or something. The other thing that stands out to Jalen is the two white eyes that are reflecting the light with a reddish glow. He hits the gas and peels out of there, fishtailing on the loose gravel. He checks the rearview mirror again and can see that thing running behind the car and it is gaining on them. It runs up behind them and jumps into the air, landing in front of the car. Only it isn't a person anymore. It's a mountain lion standing upright like a person with regular human looking legs and two strong muscular arms with black and red markings like stripes on them. Its chest and torso are also quite jacked like a human bodybuilder with rippling abs and more bizarre markings but it has the overall tan color and head of a mountain lion. It's leering at them with these ethereal white eyes, and it has these long, sharp canines hanging out of its mouth, which is twisted into an evil grin. It also has a long mountain lion tail that is leisurely swishing back and forth as it sways from side to side. Shannon screams and Jalen throws the car into reverse, almost swerving off the road before pulling a maneuver that he learned in park ranger training, where you pop the transmission into neutral and crank the wheel to spin around. It's a pretty popular movie stunt that you've probably seen a million times because it's not that hard to do, but it's a good one to know if you ever need to back out of somewhere quickly. Jalen goes flying back down the road and when he looks in the rearview mirror he doesn't see anything behind them. They finally get back to Highway 160 that leads out to Tuba City. Jalen takes a left onto the highway and to his horror sees that thing running alongside them looking directly at him the whole time. But now looks like a man again wearing a mountain lion skin and running at a like no human ever speed. Now that they're back on the paved road, even if it is one that is full of potholes and rocks, Jalen is able to pick up enough speed that the creature finally starts to fall behind and with a final burst of speed, runs up alongside the car and slaps it again, which freaks Jalen out so much that he almost crashes the car into the ditch. It also makes a loud, hissing sound that is so terrifying that it truly puts the fear of God in Jalen. And it's so loud they can hear it over the sound of the road even though the windows are rolled up. It hisses one more time before running off into the dark desert landscape. Jalen does not slow that car down the entire rest of the way to Tuba City until they have to make a quick stop for gas before driving out to the Hopi Reservation the long way. When they finally get to Shannon's mom's house, Shannon, in a quiet, shaky voice, tells her what happened, visibly shaken at having to relive the details of that horrific nightmare. Lakaila and Jalen aren't even really sure what has just happened, but they know they don't ever want to see that thing again. Shannon's mom burns some sage and says a prayer in Hopi, but Jalen's pretty sure that he's not the only one who doesn't get much sleep that night. And he only has one thing to say to whatever that thing was. Skinwalker Mountain Lion Man, let's never meet again. This next story comes from a study by William Morgan from the 1930s named Human Wolves Among the Navajo. For Morgan's study, he interviewed Navajo Indians to collect their folklore studies and personal experiences in an attempt to explain to everyone how their delusional stories are just covering for repressed Freudian impulses. Sounds like a great guy. 
This particular story from the study was posted by Reddit user Gilgamesh versus Humbaba and comes from a man named Hijago, who in the late 1920s was about 23 years old. We don't have any other names other than Hijago, so we're going to call his little sister Winona and his little brother Paco. Now, I have to admit that this one sounds quite fantastical, but it came directly from this Navajo member as his experience. I guess the real reason I want to include it is because it is a first-hand account from almost a century ago, so no internet influences at all. But I still don't know. So take a listen and let me know what you think in the comments below. It used to be that Indians would take their sheep and goats up to the mountains for winter. But instead of carrying enough corn to feed the family for the whole season, they would dig a hole next to their hogan, put their dried corn in the hole, cover it up with a rock, and disguise it so no one would know it was there. And then they would make trips down from the mountain back to the hogan to get more as needed. Hajago's family does just that before going into the mountains for the winter. But of course, after a while, they need more corn. So they send their kids, Winona and Paco, to go back to the Hogan and get some more corn. They both ride on one horse. And when they get to the Hogan, they decide it's too late to go back. So they'll just spend the night in the Hogan and get the corn and return to their parents in the morning. They also had expected to see their big brother, Hajago, there. But Hijago, who's a master with a bow and arrow, went out on a hunting trip and also found himself too far away to get home for the night. So as is common for the Navajo, he finds another Hogan in which to spend the night. So back to Winona and Paco. They tie the two front feet of their horse so he can't run anywhere and he wanders off to eat. But he comes back to the Hogan and his ears are up. Now, he can see better than the children can in the dark. So, based on his skittish behavior, Winona knows somebody's out there. Just that afternoon, some men had been near the Hogan, and Winona is pretty sure she heard one of them say, Now I can get that girl. Tad bit freaky. That night, she sees a dark shadow in the woods and immediately knows that a human wolf or what we now call a skinwalker, is after her. But she doesn't tell Paco. Instead, she digs a hole under the Hogan and tells Paco to get in. And if anyone comes, he needs to crawl outside and ride fast back to their family. And she will try to fight as long as she can. And she ties a blanket over the door as much as she can, hoping it'll slow down the wolf long enough for Paco to get away. That night, Winona is woken up when she hears some mud fall off the top of the Hogan, and she knows the wolf has come. Paco crawls out, cuts the rope around the horse's feet, and jumps on the horse. The horse, sensing the impending danger, is pretty freaked out and takes off out of there without any prodding from Paco. He runs as fast as he can towards the mountains, with Paco holding on tight to his mane. When Paco reaches his parents, he tells them what's happening back at home. His mom and dad get on their horses and ride back as fast as they can in hopes of saving Winona. Back at the Hogan, the human wolf gets in and Winona fights him as hard as she can. That night, it snows a little. And the next morning, Hajago says, this is a good day for hunting. I'm going to go shoot some rabbits. He has on some good new moccasins with heavy soles, and he has his feet in burlap sacks to keep them dry. Now remember, Hajago is the Robin Hood of the Navajos. He never misses. He sees two rabbits, knocks two arrows, and shoots them. As he's riding along, he sees a big track, but the snow has covered it, so he doesn't know whether it's a horse or a man or some other kind of animal. So he gets down off his horse, kneels down, and blows the snow off the track. That's when he sees it's a human wolf track. And there's blood, too. So he follows the track. He follows it all day. And toward evening, he comes to the edge of a mesa. 
He crawls slowly to the edge with one arrow in his bow and two in his mouth. At the edge, he comes to the last track made by that human wolf. But there's no way to get down that cliff. So he circles around and he finds just one narrow path going down. He goes along the path and sees a big stone lying against the cliff. And he knows that this is where the human wolf went. So he pulls back the stone, goes into the cave, and sees nothing. But he keeps going, and pretty soon comes to a black curtain. He pulls the curtain back and keeps going. There's a narrow passage, and he goes along for a half a mile, and then comes to another black curtain. In a half a mile, he comes to another, and then comes to a fourth one. He pulls that curtain back and finds himself in a big room that's round like a Hogan. He sees lots of men and women sitting around, people he has seen before at dances and ceremonies and around the Hogans. He sees skeletons and bones and jewelry and other things around the walls. He thinks they're going to kill me. There's a small room to his left, so he ducks in there hoping they wouldn't see him. There's one big fat man who's the chief, and he's singing. And all these people, even girls and boys, are learning how to be human wolves. The big fat man says, There's an old lady who has died about 200 miles from here, and I want two men to go there, dig her up, and take her jewelry. So, two men come in front of him, and he sings over them. And then he tells them to be careful. They take their skins and leave. Then, pointing to the room where Hijaga was hiding, someone says, there's a boy in there and he doesn't belong to us. So they bring him out and put him in the middle of the room where he is surrounded by people who clearly want to kill him. And his mind is racing, thinking, how do I get out of here? He wants to get their eagle feathers because those feathers are the key to their power. Take the feathers, take the power, and all of this will be over. But they're all around him and they're watching him. So for the moment at least, he has no choice but to just sit quietly. Up on the wall in front of him is a girl's head. And like a train wreck, whether he wants to or not, he keeps looking at it. What he doesn't know is that it's his sister. And then the big fat man asks Hijago, Do you want to be a human wolf? Hijago is pretty horrified by the idea. But the man says, you can study to be a wolf or we will kill you. So Hijago says, I will be a wolf. All the while still trying to formulate a plan for how to get out of there. Looking around, he sees that on either side of the door sits a big dog. So if he tries to run out, the dogs will freak out and he'll get caught. Then... They pass him some meat, which he doesn't want to eat because he knows the human wolves eat human meat. He figures he better take some, so he takes a piece, fakes tossing it in his mouth, but then he tucks it down inside his shirt. Soon, the big fat man falls asleep, and Hijago lays down pretending he's asleep and even snores, but the whole time his eyes are open just a crack, and he's looking around. After a while... Everyone is asleep, trusting the guard dogs to do their job. Hijago gets up, grabs his bow and arrows, which they had taken away from him, and grabs the eagle feathers. He takes a step toward the door, then another step, when one of the dogs begins to growl. He takes the meat out of his shirt, breaks it into two pieces, and gives a piece of meat to each dog, who must have been pretty hungry, because once they start eating, they forget all about guarding the door. Hijago runs through the curtain and keeps running as fast as he can. They had put wood and rocks behind the curtains so he would have a hard time, but he gets through three of the curtains just fine when he hears noises and yelling echoing through the corridor. They're coming after him. The rocks and logs piled up behind the fourth curtain are extra thick, so Hijago has a harder time getting through the last curtain. But he breaks through and starts running like the wind. And he is a fast runner, but not fast enough. 
he soon hears a wolf over there and then over there and he knows he is surrounded but as he's running he sees a badger's hole thinking fast he pulls up a big weed crawls into the hole and pulls the weed down hard so it looks like it's just growing there pretty soon the noises around him stop he pushes up the weed and looks around he hears someone coming, so he goes back down again, just as the big fat man comes running and runs right over the hole. Hijago hears him say, I wish we had killed him like I told them to. After a while, Hijago comes out. The coast is clear, and he runs back home. When he gets there, the sole of his new moccasin is worn out, and his foot is sore. A couple of nights later, there's a gathering for a war dance nearby, and his family goes over there. But Hijago doesn't go because his foot is still sore. But later, he changes his mind and uses his bow and arrows like a cane and decides he's strong enough to walk over there. When he gets there, he sees the big fat man who is chief of the human wolves sitting on a big white horse. He and his wife are all dressed in fine clothes with lots of bracelets and necklaces. Hijago says, I'm going to shoot that man. So he quietly goes around the circle of wagons and people until he is right behind the man. He knocks an arrow and gives the bow a long pull, aiming squarely at that big fat man's back. He looses the arrow, which goes in so far that only a little bit remains visible. And that, my friends, is where Hijago ends his story. A big special thanks to our newest Hoopy Food Level members, Elizabeth Sisney and Nexer EH. Thank you so much, you guys. Your support means more than you know. Those stories were sure a couple of wild rides, but if you want to turn right back around and get in line to ride again, go ahead and watch this one. But I hope you didn't just eat lunch. Be careful out there, and I will see you here again on The In Between. <laughs>